<laughs> this is Pet Life Radio. Let's talk pets. Hello and welcome to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. Thank you for joining us today. We're your hosts. My name is Marcy Davis and my co-host is my amazing service dog, Lovey. And we're so excited to be with you today to talk about our favorite subject, working dogs and working animals. And today we're going to be visiting with Barbara Hensky. And Barbara is a best-selling author of the Rosemont series of novels. And you may have heard of The Christmas Club, which was actually made into a 2019 Hallmark Channel Christmas movie. And she's also the author of a brand new book called Guiding Emily. And she's with us today to talk about her new book. And you guessed it, it's a unique kind of incredible love story between a guide dog and his handler. So come right back after these quick messages as we welcome Barbara Hensky to the show. So now I've got this pack of four Sharpe Rescue dogs for, oh my goodness, probably five, six years. They get a regular diet of Dynavite with every meal. D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. People remark on what beautiful coats they've got. I tell them, you don't need to wait until a problem presents itself. It's far better to keep the dog happy and healthy at all times. You won't believe how happy your dog will be. I get my Dynavite from D-I-N-O-V-I-T-E dot com. Let's Talk Pets on PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. We're so thrilled to have Barbara Hensky with us today. Hello, Barbara, and welcome. Good morning. I'm so thrilled to be here. Yeah, we're so excited that you're here and we really want to jump right in and just start talking about your awesome new book. And you've been so successful with all of your books um, up to this point with Rosemont series and the Christmas Club. But I have to ask you, Barbara, how did you find yourself drawn to writing a book about a guide dog and his handler in your new book? Well, thank you for asking that. This whole idea started in February of 2019 when I was touring the Foundation for Blind Children in Phoenix, Arizona. I live less than a mile away from the facility, have lived there for 30 plus years and had never been inside, ever taken a tour. And it happened that I was seated next to the development director of the foundation at a library gala benefit. And uh, we were chatting and he said, oh my goodness, you're right down the street. You and your husband should come next week and I'll give you a tour. So we did that. And school was in session then and I was able to see with my own eyes the remarkable work that that foundation was doing with the children in its care. And um, they service children from ages zero to 103 as their oldest child. So they have a large adult population. And at the end, I was so moved when I toured the foundation and witnessed the incredible work that they were doing with children in their classroom. One particular incident really got me. A four-year-old child threw his arms around me, gave me a big hug, and he's, you know, shaking. He's giggling so hard. I've got my hand on his back. And he was blind and deaf. Steve told me that he had been born blind and deaf and with other disabilities, other complications. And his parents had been told that he probably wouldn't live very long. So these heartbroken parents refused to accept that prognosis for this child and brought him to the foundation. And there he was, four years old, four years later, in my arms, hugging me, very much walking and talking, which they had been told he would never do, and living this bright future that very few people imagined he would have. That was incredibly moving to me. So I said to Steve, you know, what do you need? What can I do to help you? 
And he said, well, we service children from ages zero to 103. We have a I big love adult that. Popu- yep. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Population. And we need two things. We need to raise awareness of the isolation that the visually impaired feel within the sighted community. And we're a nonprofit. We need money. Yeah. That's the bottom and line. Yeah. The bottom yeah. And I said, well, great, I can help with both those things because I'm a successful novelist and a book can raise awareness and can raise money. I'm donating half of my proceeds from Guiding Emily to the Foundation. Love it. Yeah. So that's how that whole thing, I woke up that morning, I had no idea that I was going to be writing this book. And by the time I was back home at 10 in the morning, I had said, you know what, I need to come up with a book. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your life had changed. Yeah. My life just, had changed. Yeah. I, I just love those experiences where something so profound as that experience just changes you. And then look what you created as a result of that. So that's so awesome. And and I just have to say and really appreciate what you're saying about um, people who do have vision loss. And, and I, I just can't imagine having vision loss and hearing loss and trying mm-hmm. to move through the world that way. Um, just I have always thought that that would be one of the most difficult disabilities to have. And I have so much respect for people that have that and how they do navigate the world is just so phenomenal and impressive. So I just really want to honor what you shared and really and just acknowledge that because it is raising that awareness regarding that is just so awesome. I just love it. So what led you? So after that experience, what was your next step? How did you go to create the characters of Emily and Garth? When did they appear to you? What? How did that evolve? Well, you know, that was interesting because I got the bright idea. I'm going to write a book, but then it's like, oh, okay, well, now what? <laughs> right. And I knew I needed to do a lot of research. I needed to do medical research to figure out what sort of vision loss the main character would have. At that point, the only thing I had was her name, Emily Main, because at that library gala where I met Steve, I was auctioning off in a live auction naming rights to a character in my next book. And the person who bought that at the live auction was Emily Maine. So, okay, I have the the name of a main (laughs) character. So I started doing research. The foundation was incredibly welcoming and helpful to me. One of their counselors is a woman by the name of Julie Rock, and she has a guide dog named Neoki that she works with. And Julie was kind enough to get the approval from her adult, one of her adult counseling classes of newly blind individuals. They all signed waivers and let me sit in on their sessions. What a brave thing for them to allow me to do. And that's when I really, really learned about this isolation issue and how you self-isolate, how other people isolate you. I certainly became aware that of something maybe we can talk about it later, but of how I isolated a blind gentleman in another department when I was working in the corporate world. And of course, I didn't mean to, but that doesn't really help things. You know, you need to be aware of things. So I learned about that. The foundation gave me white cane training. Cool. Which which I'd like to talk about. That was really helpful. But in terms of how... put, So as I was putting this together and I was realizing... Emily's story of losing her eyesight and then kind of regaining her path to independence was going to be a very heavy, if I did it accurately, was going to be a very heavy story arc. And I like to write upbeat and uplifting things. Mm -hmm. So I decided, well, I want to have the guide dog's experience. And I created Garth the guide dog (laughs) so that he could lighten the book, which I think he does very effectively. And he's just such a great character, one of my favorite characters (laughs) I've ever written. Yeah. Well, and I was wondering about that, about how it was for you writing as Garth. And I was wondering how you, what kind of research you did. So it sounds like you really immersed yourself in the whole blind culture um, and disability culture, which is really what we refer to it as. So, but I was wondering, how was it? writing as Garth and how did you get into his head and about what it was like for him to be Emily's guide dog? 
Well, that was certainly the fun part of it. Uh, first of all, I'm a dog person and I have dogs so, and I've always had dogs. So I have my own ideas. I think we all kind of personify our dogs. So I had that little bit of a background, but then I decided I needed to do the same kind of research inside of a guide dog training school that I had done at the foundation. So I started asking every single person I knew if they knew anybody who was a puppy raiser or who had connections. And through that, I was able to network to a local newscaster. Her name is Christy Siefkin. She's at one of the the local Fox affiliate and she's a puppy raiser. And Christy very kindly opened doors for me at Guide Dogs for the Blind in San Rafael, California. And they let me come out and spend three days with them behind the scenes and kind of rolled back the curtain and let me see that whole process. Oh, that was Which perfect. Was, yeah. Oh, it was, so, you know, I got to go to a seminar that they hold for people who are, cons- for blind people who are considering using, uh, getting a guide dog so that they could test it out and find out about that world. I attended a graduation ceremony. Oh, those are so uh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. There's not enough. Never a dry to- eye at those. No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My husband uh, said, oh, I'm not going to cry. Yeah, right. he cried. Um, so did I, and I'm bawling. Yeah, I said yeah. the same thing at every graduation. Yeah. <laughs> it was so moving. So, and then, of course, Julie Rock and her dog, Neoki, who is the prototype for Garth, was kind of always there. And it, as it turned out, Julie has always worked with dogs her whole life and has been, you know, she's got her own guide dog, but she trains dogs and she professionally shows dogs at very high levels. Nice. So... My two dogs were, I'm a pathetic dog trainer, and so I enrolled in her dog training classes for both of them, and she took us in hand. The training was more for me than my dogs, honestly, but I got to know her and Nyoki, who was always at every lesson, kind of just holding forth. So it was a real interesting connection. I was just curious, is that where you got the black lab from? Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah, he's a black lab. That is not his photo on the cover it's a stock photo, but yeah, he looks very much like that. I wondered who the inspiration was for that black lab. <laughs> yeah. 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 Lovey's a black lab. Yeah. So, so yeah. So I was really excited to see a black lab on the cover. I love them all, but yeah, but there's something about a black lab as a guide dog. Well, and oh my goodness, and he's so beautiful. Yeah. Such, I bet. And your so dog's name is Lovey. That's Lovey. a great name. Yes. Oh, <laughs> I know when I first name. met her and they told me Lovey, I'm like, of course her name is Lovey. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, but that's so great that you got to spend that much time with, oh. with a team, with a true working mm-hmm. dog, guide dog team. So yes. that must have been incredible for you as someone who had never been in that world. No, before that point, I really never knew anybody who used a service dog of any kind. Yeah, and it is a whole different world to, to step into that and to really start to understand the amount of training and uh, work, continual work that it is yeah. to be a really good, effective team together. And one thing that when I was at Guide Dogs for the Blind, they were so kind to me, and I said, well, what do you need? What can I do to help you? I'm, you know, the money is going to the foundation. I'm not going to split the money up, but what can I do? And they said, please raise awareness of the significant issues faced by legitimate service dogs from phony service dogs. You know, all these people that buy the $20 vest from the internet, slap it on their dog, Mm -hmm. and it just wreaks havoc. Yes, Um, it does. Yeah. Yeah, that's a huge issue, and it, and it's so it's so unfortunate that people. Mm-hmm. And I think it is. I want to hear your opinion of that. But for me, it really does seem like people who just are uneducated and inexperienced with what a true guide dog, service dog, seizure dog, what has gone into them to make them have the abilities to fit that role and to help someone with with major, major disabilities like Mm -hmm. myself. You know, Mm -hmm. it's really, it's hard if you don't know. But what what are your thoughts? Tell me more about what you think about that and what you want people to know. I hope you're right. I hope it is just a lack of education versus a lack of 
concern and compassion for your fellow man. So I'm going with it's a lack of education. I think people don't, I have people tell me all the time, oh my goodness, I didn't realize it took so long to train them. Not that it's it's a monetary thing, but I'm told by guide dogs, it costs, it, the investment in a guide dog is about $50,000. That's correct. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's huge. Yeah. And I um, even think that is, you know, that's modest, really, for everything that goes into them for an entire two-year period. It's yeah. it's a big investment. It is. And to think of, well, Julie told me that her dog, Miyoki, was attacked by a phony service dog at Disneyland, Mm -hmm. a Siberian Husky. Fortunately, this dog lunged and bit Neoki at the harness, so his Mm -hmm. teeth were sunk into the harness. Good, yeah. Fortunately, that that harness saved him because she said he was going for the lung area. It was a kill Mm -hmm. lunge. I've had that experience, yes, yes. Yes, it happened to me twice. Yes, once getting on the subway in Washington, D.C., and another time um, at a conference. I was at a disability conference, and somebody had a dog there who they were. It was not a trained service dog, and that dog tried to attack my service dog at the time. So, yeah, I know exactly, and it's horrific. And it can also cause a dog to stop working, you know, because it's so traumatic for them. Well, Julie, I guess, knew and you must have known what to do to tell your dog you're okay and not traumatize the dog. That, to me, was just astounding. The idea that you could be out and about at your conference, going on the subway, and all of a sudden your service dog is just permanently put out of commission, that is just horrific. We cannot tolerate this. Yeah. As a society, we cannot. We need to be more inclusive and understanding about dogs. I still, I follow all the blogs and I still am astounded at the number of people who, you know, are supposed to get a ride to the airport on one of these vans that picks up multiple people and somebody says, oh, I'm allergic to dogs, so you Mm -hmm. can't get on the van. Yes. (laughs) Oh, good. So then you can. Flights. Yes. Yes. Then, yeah, you can miss your flight. What in the heck? is the matter with people. Yeah, it, you know, it's I'm, another barrier that people with disabilities have to experience and plan for and think about, which is so unfortunate. But I, every time I fly, I worry, and if I don't have my own van transporting mm-hmm. me, I do worry about that because it happened to me in Boston, a city that you would think that would never happen in. Yeah. The taxi driver refused to take me and my service dog to the airport, but I actually followed through with it, Barbara, and I I did. I contacted the police and found out there was a taxi division of the police, and I filed a complaint, and actually that person had to go through training regarding service dogs (laughs) so that it wouldn't happen again, and I hope that that helped, but I didn't let it go because it was so bad of how that person treated me and my dog that I couldn't let it go. Yeah. But good for you. Oh my gosh, good for you for doing that. But but not everybody really has the time to do all that. And And it's humiliating, you know, I had to go through the process. So you have to pick and choose those battles. Yeah. Yeah, unfortunately. But it's so great that you're trying to promote that awareness and help hopefully help people to understand the significance and the consequences of slapping, you know, a fake vest mm-hmm. on their dog. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty. Um, and now that I'm aware of the issue, I see it all the time. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. 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 You when, know how yeah. that works. It's like all yeah. of a sudden it's like, oh, my goodness, this isn't far-fetched. It's like every time I go out. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we are going to take just a quick break and we're going to come back and we're going to keep visiting with Barbara about her book and um, just all of her great experiences in writing it. So come right back after these important messages from our sponsors that we love. So come right back. Looking for a dental treat that does more for your dog? Daily Dose is a two-in-one chew that pairs a daily dental scrub with powerful supplements. 
to help with the biggest health concerns facing our dogs. Daily Dose was developed by vets to be simple to use and super effective. Plus, dogs love the taste. Available for joint, skin, heart health, or calming. Daily Dose, your pet's daily dose of awesome. Visit yourpetsdailydose.com to save $3 on your first bag with promo code PETLIFE. That's yourpetsdailydose.com. Let's talk pets. Let's talk pets on Pet Life Radio. Pet Life Radio. PetLifeRadio.com. Welcome back to Working Like Dogs on Pet Life Radio. We're visiting today with best selling author Barbara Hensky about her new awesome book, Guiding Emily. And boy, Barbara, we were having such a robust discussion about fake service dogs before the break. And I, I just really want to honor that again with you and thank you for the work that you're doing around that. And any other thoughts about that that you want to share with us and our listeners? Because it's just such an important issue. Well, it certainly is. It's it's distressing to me to hear you know, traveling is hard enough, let alone people who are discriminated against. Um, and I realize, you know, because of their dogs and things are made more inconvenient, I realize that the laws provide that they can't do that. But in the moment when you need to make that flight, you need to get the taxi, you need to get on that train, starting to spout to someone that, you know, you're violating the law probably doesn't get you anywhere <laughs> no. um, other than raises your blood pressure. So to everyone listening, I am so sorry. And I will work as hard as I possibly can to change that. And if anyone wants to contact me and share with me their experiences so that I can, Guiding Emily is the first in a series, I can put a situation and a scenario in each and every book to raise awareness because I think books are an effective way to do that. So I'd love to hear from your readers, you know, if they've got something they want me to address. Oh, I love it. Yeah. And I'm so excited that this is going to be a series. That is so cool. So can you tell us a little bit about what you're thinking about that? Yes. Now that the first book has been out and I've gathered some feedback, a couple of things. People um, want to, well, I don't want to do any giveaways, <laughs> but there will be more with her husband and her friend. Obviously, Garth will continue on for sure. I've heard from a number of people who use guide dogs, you know, since I've published this and talked to them. One of the questions I ask people is, can you tell if your dog likes someone versus doesn't like some? Can you tell the people they like? Mm -hmm. And maybe you can tell me about Lovey. Mm -hmm. The response is overwhelming. Oh, yeah, we know who they Mm -hmm. like and don't like. Right. (laughs) Yes, and I really listen to that. Yeah, I'm paying attention to that because, boy, that tells me a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's good because I'm going to be writing that. Garth is going to be a very opinionated um, dog. (laughs) And one woman was recounting to me an experience where she feels like her dog set her up or really set her up kind of with the man that she ended up marrying. Um, She was out, I believe she was at a wedding reception and she wasn't holding the harness. She was just holding the leash and she was talking to this guy that somebody, however, you know, she was talking to this other wedding guest and her dog walked around her and encircled both of them in the leash and, you know, they're talking to each other and probably flirting a little bit. And mm-hmm. they're not paying attention to her dog. And the dog <laughs> is, like, getting the leash tighter and tighter. <laughs> and oh, she ended up marrying that guy. Oh, Isn't that I a that. Yes. great story? That's got to be in the book. Because oh, who yeah. wouldn't love Garth? Oh. So maybe he'll be a little bit of a matchmaker. Oh, I love that. Well, mm-hmm. all of my dogs, I have had four. And all wow. of them have loved my husband much more than me. I have to say that. They all adore that. him. They've all adored him because he's their playmate. And so oh, they, yeah, yeah. So it's, I could see that easily. Sparks were flying and the, the dog was helping those sparks. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's so a wonderful, wonderful thing. We all want to think that. But, you know, I think Emily needs to go on. I think she needs to have a happy future. She needs to have 
children. Yeah. Have a life. Uh, yeah. And yeah. a life. Yeah. Which, you know, so many people, I've had so many people say to me, oh, I'm so sorry that you, you know, you have a disability. And I'm just like, you know, that is such a small part of who I am because right. I work. I have a businesses. I have a husband. I have, you know. I have interest. And so I love that you're right. This is one of the things I love probably the most about the book is that you are showing that you're demonstrating that where someone is successful, they can have a life and they can have all these experiences. And yes, they may be blind, but again, that's one small part of who they are. Mm -hmm. But because of that blindness, they get to have this phenomenal relationship with a canine. So how lucky is that? Yeah. So I, I just love that you're, you're sharing that and you're creating it and showing people the inside of that. So I have to ask you, what do you think, Barbara, of writing this book? What do you think? How has this book changed you from all these experiences that you you shared with us that you had in researching it? What's had the greatest impact or significance for you? Well, I'm certainly so much more aware that you know, disabilities don't have the impact on your future and certainly not on your possibilities and your happiness. Those things don't rob them, you know, the positive life forces from you. And I've observed so many people at different stages along the way. And yes, it is scary. Yes, there's a lot to overcome. But just the fact that somebody does step into a new future is so empowering to them. It's like the people who have done that sort of have a little bit of a superpower that people who haven't been tested don't have. It's been inspiring and just over, just so encouraging. And so that's what I'm hoping I'm conveying, whether you have a vision disability, another disability, just anxiety issues, no disability, whatever. I hope that these books show someone conquering the issues that everybody faces in life with courage and integrity and positivity, and everybody can grab onto that. Yeah, and everybody needs that. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. I love that your books are upbeat and and uplifting because it is so important that we have that hope and that we hang on to that Mm -hmm. and that things can turn around. And yes, we may have some, you know, some dark days, but also there are some very bright, beautiful days ahead as well. So I just love that. And what do you want your readers to take away from guiding Emily? What is the message that you really want to get across to them? I want my readers, obviously, to be aware of the isolation issues and the issues with service dogs. And I want them to come away with the knowledge that these are issues that can be changed one-on-one. This doesn't necessarily have to be a big moment. You don't have to go to Washington and lobby. You can implement this in your day-to-day life by your own actions of kindness to other people and responsibility with your animals. So this is an on-the-ground, grassroots sort of thing. They can have a huge impact. Yeah, I love that. I love that you're bringing it to the individual. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's our own individual choices. And I think respect, respect for these canines and what their job is, what their training has been, and what need they fulfill. Because the other thing I was thinking of when you were talking about traveling and how difficult it is, and what I was thinking was, yes, it is difficult. And because of these guide dogs, and service dogs, we are able to travel. It does remove all Mm -hmm. of those barriers for us to get on an airplane, a train, a bus, whatever it is, that otherwise we wouldn't be able to without these incredible canine partners. And so it is so unfortunate that these other things that are so ridiculous are impacting that. So, yeah, so I do love that and that that realization of the independence and which is what, what you have so much of in the book for Emily of gaining her independence and how these dogs impact that. 
So I know our time is almost up, but there's one question I do want to ask you because I just I think it's so cool. And that was what was it like having your book, The Christmas Club, made into a Hallmark Channel movie? Oh, gosh, that was a dream come true. I'm telling you, um, they, they changed the story quite a bit, but they did a beautiful screen adaptation. And seeing my name on the screen yeah. was quite the moment. And my husband and I got to spend a week on location while they were filming. And we were in the video village, which is where the director and the producers sit. And gosh, they gave us the headsets and yeah, you know, we were all plugged into everything and the big monitors and you can see it as all as it's being filmed. And seeing words that I wrote being spoken by these incredibly beautiful actors. It was quite the moment. My husband and I both got teary a number of times. And, you know, I didn't know what to expect. I thought, well, maybe I'm going to be in the way. I'm just this author. Oh, boy, they're going to be in the way. They were so kind and lovely to us the entire week. Everyone was just nice to each other. There was nobody being snippy. And they were working 12-hour minimum days And it was very hot when it was being filmed. And, you know, the actors are in winter coats and scarves, and it was miserable for them. Everybody was lovely. So what an experience. Oh, I can only imagine. That does seem like a dream come true. That's why I had to ask about that because, oh, as an author, that's like the ultimate to have your your book made into a Hallmark Channel movie and a Christmas one at that. That's just, yeah, what icing on a professional cake that is. (laughs) It, It was, and it gave me contacts that I've been able to use to market and basically bring Guiding Emily to the forefront. And I'm very much hoping that we'll sell the screen rights for Guiding Emily and raise money for the foundation. Yeah, that's what I was thinking is I want to see Guiding Emily on the Hallmark Channel. Yeah, or or any big screen. Yeah, yeah. And I would, I don't know if this is possible. Maybe your readers can, or your listeners can give me information on this. I would kind of like the main actress to be a blind woman. Is there any Absolutely. reason why that? Absolutely. It should be. Of course. It should yes, be. Yes, yes. And I'm sure there's so, lots of actresses out there who are blind that would be stepping up for that role. Yeah, that would be awesome. I love it. So I'm just putting it out in the universe. Yeah, well, we'll put that out there too. Yes, yep. that would be wonderful. Yep. That would be so great. Well, I cannot thank you enough, Barbara, for being with us and for sharing your experiences. It's just been such a delight. And before you leave us today, I do want to ask you, how can our listeners get more information about your advocacy and the work that you're doing and the book and the series? What's the best way to keep in touch with you and connect it? Thank you. So my website, which is barbarahinsky.com, my email, bhinsky, H-I-N-S-K-E, at gmail.com. And Guiding Emily is available on Amazon. It'll soon be in audio, but it's available in Braille from the Foundation for Blind Children, and it's on Bookshare as well. Right now. Love it. I love that it's in yeah. Braille. Oh, that's so great. Yeah, that's, that's I've got my own Braille copy and it's wonderful. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, well, yay, Barbara. Just yeah. love the book. Love what you're doing. Thank you so much for your leadership, your advocacy, and for your contributions to the Foundation for Blind Children. That's so wonderful. Thank you. So Everything you're doing is just so beautiful. Thank you so much. And we hope you'll come back and be with us again as your series continues. I would be honored. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me on. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. And thank you, our listeners, for being with us. We love it when you join us. And you know that Lovey and I love to hear from you. So let's keep connected. Keep those questions, comments, and ideas for future shows. You guys are great at that. And you can email me at Marcy, M-A-R-C-I-E, at PetLifeRadio.com. And you know you can also follow Working Like Dogs Always on Facebook and Instagram. We love connecting with you and we really love seeing photos of your working dogs and the incredible work that they're doing every day. So thank you so much for being with us and we look forward to being with you again soon. Take good care. Let's Talk Pets every week on demand only on PetLifeRadio.com.